I'm John Bowden. As most of you know, one of my all-time favorite albums is the first Mike Rutherford solo album. Didn't do very well, didn't sell a lot, changed my freaking life. It's called Small Creeps Day. And the singer on that, Noel McCalla. He's our special guest. Part one on Rocky Street Music. Small Creeps Day was released February 15th, 1980. Recorded in 1979, produced by David Henschel, featuring Simon Phillips on drums, Morris Pert, percussions, Ant Phillips, formerly of Genesis, on keyboards, Mike Rutherford, of course, took care of all the guitars, and vocalist Noel McCalla. You know, we all have those moments where you first hear someone and you stop in your tracks and you're going, okay, things have changed now because I've heard this or whatever it might be for you, right? When I heard Noel singing, it surpassed anything at that point and since that I'd listened to in Genesis. Don't get me wrong, I'm a huge Genesis fan. And now I think a lot of folks who watch this channel are used to me saying, of all the Genesis albums and solo albums, Small Creeps Day is my favorite. Noel McCalla was a big part of that. Where a few days ago, we just started our series with David Henschel, who produced the album, as I mentioned. We've talked to Ant Phillips twice. He's still got some more left in that series coming up in a few days. We had Brian Coombs yesterday, who performed Small Creeps Day on stage in England last year with Noel McCalla. Have I mentioned, this guy is one of my favorite singers of all time. He was a backup singer for Sniffing the Tears, was a lead singer for Man for Man for quite a long time, and currently has this outfit called Some Kind of Wonderful, where they do the music of Stevie Wonder. A lot of great Motown stuff. When Noel McCalla sings, I get inspired. He's one of the good ones. He's our special guest on Rock History Music. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the album is very nice. You know, I I listened to it just not so long ago because I'm having to routine. At the end of the day, yeah, we're going to pass another one. It's one of the most beautiful songs I have ever heard in my entire life. Oh, there you go. Beautiful. You are a lot to do with that. Well, you know, i tell you what. Uh, I don't want to take all the credit. Mike did a fantastic job with that material. And he just needed a good voice to be able to sing on there. It could have been any voice, really. It could have been because, because of the nature of the material. I think that's what's made it succeed even more so than me singing on it to tell you the truth i just stepped in and i'd give it another edge as i've mentioned and i've done it justice and that's what people are referring to all these years on so i don't take full credit for all of this i've just been you know in a, in a sense i'm a hired hand and i try and do the best i can no matter who i work with very proud of that album. You know, like I, I my upbringing has been, been very much like soul and, and jazz and funk, you know, all those sort of idioms, you know, like uh, old school, old school soul music, really. I got brought up in a household where my sisters were playing Otis Redden and, and you know, all, all the different bands that come from that era. And it was very much a surprise that t coming from that school that I got a call asking to do prog rock. Because of your background, I think that's why I related to a little bit more, because you couldn't hide your R&B and, and, and all, I mean, being one of eight kids and all that mismatch of everything you were hearing, don't you think that made a difference? I think so. I think so, because I think, you know, if someone is introduced to a different genre and you're asked to kind of uh, at least recognize what you're stepping into, you can never really do it out how you would want to do it, but you do it in a manner which... Just kind of, you know, me coming from soul, I put soul into it. That's what I did. That's all I did. I just put my soul into a prog rock situation and it worked. I, I'm not saying it was 100% through and through. You'd get remarks from people who say, oh, it's a bit too soulful, you know. But on that occasion, because of the material itself and the way it was so well produced and written, it just all seemed to all come together. And I've recognized over the years just how popular that album still remains. It's kind of a little bit of a cult album as regards Genesis projects, you know, like uh, uh, releases uh, have gone. So I'm really, I'm really pleased to have been a part of that time, of that, uh, you know, of that era, which is fantastic for me because it's just another little notch in my, my, uh, my rod, you know? I only wanted you to join Genesis, even though I know you probably had other plans. Well, at the time, I didn't really, because I was sort of hopping about from pillar to post, really. And like I found out at that time that uh, I was shortlisted to join Genesis after Peter Gabriel stepped down. How far back do you go with Small Creep State, like with Mike? I mean, when did that start? You tell me what the date of the album was. <laughs> 19 <laughs> that far back now. 1980. 1980. Okay, I was working my own band. I had my own little club band. We were doing some gigs here and there around London. 
he might decided that he wanted to do an album and you know rumors had it that uh i was available uh i don't think he knew actually that much about me at the time but obviously as people do they check you out and uh, find out a bit more about you and he just thought i would be the sort of voice that would suit his album but i was working with a band called sniffing the tears remember them sniffing mm-hmm. the tears yeah driver's seat had a that's the one. So I came out and did a tour with them out in America. We're out there for about 11 weeks, supporting Foreigner most of the time. And I got a call from Alfonso Johnson asking me if I would come over and help him out on his album in Los Angeles. We were having a breakout somewhere in New Orleans at the time. And I really, really wanted to see New Orleans. Mm. <laughs> and like, so it was a bit of a drag. I was thinking, oh, it's not a great time to call me. You know, but I went over and did some work with uh, with Alfonso Johnson. And he had, at the time, when I went to visit him, he walked in with a white label of Phil Collins' album, Face Value, which he had just finished recording with him. So he sent in the, the white label for him to take a listen to it. And it all kind of got mixed up. It was that long ago, I wasn't sure whether Sniff and the Tears came first, whether it was Mike Rutherford that came first, or whether it was Alfonso Johnson. It's, you know, it's, it's all kind of quite chaotic. You know? and, and, uh, and it just turned out that Mike says, yeah, come along and let's have a go. And here we are, how many, how many years later? There you have it. Part one of our conversation with one of my favorite singers of all time, Noel McCalla. When he sings, I stop. I don't multitask. I stop. I listen. I get inspired. I feel better. We'll have more from Noel McCalla coming up next Thursday. He's going to talk about his time, of course, with Manford Mann. We'll talk more about Small Creeps Day. And a lot of you have been telling me, please get Noel McCalla on the channel. Well, there you go. He's here. He's he's one of us now. (laughs) There'll be links on how you can listen to a lot more Noel McCalla music in the very top description section of this video. I'm John Bowden. Make sure you comment on our video, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. You want to help this channel? Buy a t-shirt. You'll get a good quality t-shirt, and you'll help us hire students to basically edit these videos so we can get them out to you faster. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Music.